Susan A. Joy Jones, and it is my honor to serve as the Rone Mitchell Director of the Museum of the City of New York. And I welcome you all here this evening. We have a terrific program, a conversation between Sam Roberts and Harold Holzer on the occasion of Sam's new book, A History of New York in 101 Objects. Um, now, here is a title uh, that really gives you some idea about what you're gonna discover in Sam's book, but it's Sam's selection uh, that makes it ever so much more marvelous. It is personal and idiosyncratic um, and completely fascinating. Um, the objects presented are sort of launch pads for stories, uh, historical histories, short histories uh, for 101 different objects. And to paraphrase Sam in his intro, some of these objects are remarkable, some mundane, uh, and they eloquently objectify and illuminate history. Um, I can't think, by the way, of a better person uh, to engage Sam in a learned and li lively conversation um, than Harold Holzer, uh, the distinguished Civil War, War scholar and vice president of public affairs at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, many of the objects from the book, I want you all to know, are currently on view just across the park uh, in an exhibition at the New York Historical Society. And I want you all to go over and see that show. When does it close, Sam? November 30th. November 30th, you have one month. Um, I'd like to thank Louise Mirror and the Historical Society for co-sponsoring this program. I, and I extend a very warm welcome um, to the Historical Society members who are here with us this evening. Um, and I would like the borough historians, uh, Michael Michion, uh, Ron Swider, uh, Lloyd Boltan, and Jack Eichenbaum. Will they please stand? They're all in one corner. This is very, one specific, in the back. Never again, never again. Well, we had something of a clump. But in, in any case, they are our honorary co-sponsors, and um, and they were also on the phone and in meetings with Sam um, as he put together his book. Um, and also, thank you, Kate Gales of Simon and Schuster, uh, for your help in putting together tonight's program. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Sam. Uh, Roberts and how, how Harold Holzer a little more fully. I'm going to start with uh, Harold. A um, uh, prodigious scholar, Holzer is the author, co-author, or editor of 47 books on Lincoln and the Civil War era. Um, his latest is Lincoln and the Power of the Press, The War for Public Opinion. And boy, did it get a rave review in yesterday's Times book review section. Did anybody see it? Oh yes, a lot of people saw it. Harold raised his hand. Uh, the, the reviewer, David Reynolds, called it a monumental, richly detailed portrait of the world of 19th century journalism and Lincoln's relationship to, to it. And later, um, David Reynolds said that the book was full of fresh information and superb analysis, and that Holzer's engaging, deeply researched book is destined to be recognized as a classic. You can't do any better than that. I don't think you can do any better than that. So um, another recent book is The Civil War in 50 Objects which traces the conflict through the collections of the Historical Society, uh, for which um, Harold serves as the Roger Hurtog Fellow. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, this is all at the same time 
that, that uh, he pursues a professional career at the Metropolitan Museum where he has worked for the last 22 years. Kind of amazing. Now, Sam Roberts, um, Sam Roberts walks on water. He has been such a wonderful friend to the Museum of the City of New York. Um, we have had the honor of, uh, and pleasure of working with Sam in lots of capacities. And I remember um, in 2010, uh, Sam was the editor of, of, a, of, a, of a book uh, called America's Mayor, John B. Lindsay and the Reinvention of New York. Um, and that was a companion book for an exhibition that we curated here at the City Museum. And um, that exhibition and that book um, uh, was one that was very well reviewed. And I can remember that Ed Rothstein said in his review that regardless of what you think about Lindsay, that this exhibition and Sam's book will teach you things, will educate you things about things that you never, ever knew about Lindsay. Um, so many of you know that Sam is the urban affairs correspondent for the New York Times, which is his official title since 2005. But in truth, Sam has been with the New York Times for what I count to be three decades, Sam. It's three decades. Now, I don't think there's anybody else there, is there? Um, so uh, before that, there was a before. Uh, Sam was a reporter and leader and editor for the Daily News. His writing has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, uh, the New Republic, uh, New York Magazine, and he is the author of Grand Central, How a Train Station Transformed America, which came out in 2013, and The Brother, An Untold Story of the Rosenberg um, Adam Spy Case, which was originally published in 2003, but very importantly, a new edition um, with new information um, is hot off Simon & Schuster's presses. Um, so I guess we can ask Sam about that too tonight. Um, and as many of you know too, Sam is the host of the New York Times Close Up, a weekly news and interview program on NY1, New York One, which was launched in 1992. Uh, finally, Sam is a native New Yorker. Yeah. <laughs> My, I came from New Jersey. Uh, after uh, Harold and Sam's conversation, uh, we invite you all to come upstairs for a book signing and a reception, uh, most generously provided uh, uh, by Simon & Schuster, and thank you for that, and Glazer's Bake Shop, which was established in 1902, and who make one of the most desirable of Sam's 101 objects, <laughs> the black and white cookie. <laughs> Sam and Howard. <laughs> Susan really did it, right? We didn't really be out to do uh, too much. So welcome everyone. I'm going to be, I'm, Sam has been interviewing me for 40 years, so I get to interview him today, and I see the, the dust jacket is on screen, but there's nothing like a book. There's nothing like print. So this is the book, which you will have the opportunity to, uh, to buy if you don't join and get it as a premium and have Sam sign after the program, in between bites of the black and white cookie. <laughs> so, we're here to discuss a few of the 101 objects that Sam Roberts chose. It's great that we're here with well, someone who's a New York icon who could have been number 102 in his own <laughs> book. And as Susan, as the director,
director was telling you, he has assembled a book with objects that are really masterfully selected, persuasively defended, beautifully described, and constitute not only a fun read, as everything Sam writes is fun to read, um, but a, a, an illuminating survey of both the familiar and the astounding and obscure about our city and its history. And in the aggregate, and I appreciated this particularly, it's really brilliantly researched um, history of our city. And you selected not 50, as I did over on the other side. You've got to do 100, um, which, is, uh, which is a big job. Um, how, many, how many objects did not make the cut, would you say? Harold, let me just begin by thanking you for your generosity in turning the tables and interviewing me, uh, congratulating you on your book, congratulating you on your book, uh, and thanking the Museum of the City of New York and the New York Historical Society and all the other co-sponsors. I've told a lot of people that their object, their suggested object, was number 102. <laughs> I have to admit. Uh, but the big problem was not finding 101 in the conceit of this book, I have to admit. It was inspired by the British Museum and BBC collaboration on the history of the world in 100 objects. Of course, you couldn't do New York in merely 100. It took at least 101. But the problem was not finding 101, it was winnowing them down to 101 because there were just so many. And it started off as an article in the New York Times where I began with 50 and then solicited suggestions from readers. And we got hundreds and hundreds of suggestions from readers, not just in the city, but what's so surprising was readers all over the country and all over the world. And not just expatriate New Yorkers, but people who had some connection with New York, however tangential it seemed to be. Um, they had seen a movie, they had seen, uh, read a book, uh, and these were good suggestions. So the problem was winnowing them down and deciding you know, what to leave out, what to include, and what kind of objects met the very informal, very subjective criteria that I set for myself. The important thing to remember is this is not the list of objects. It is not even a list. It's my list. And the whole fun of this book is that we can each come up with our own list of objects, and we invite readers to do just that. And of course, New Yorkers would never be rude enough to disagree with your selection. <laughs> well, my Go down big, the list. My big mistake was in the original Times article. I thought I was being very clever and left out the subway token. Because uh, I said, well, that's just too obvious. Everyone would put that in. So I included the Metro card. Well, I learned my lesson. The subway token is definitely in this book. <laughs> so let me, let me start with, I hope this works. I'm always a little nervous about the first. OK, this is not going to look like an obvious choice for those of you who haven't read the book. But Sam decided to start not with what was obvious, the colonial or Dutch eras, but with geology and the age of dinosaurs. I'll just skip ahead to this thing here. We do them both together. But it's, tell us a bit about how you decided on the Fordham Nice. Am I pronouncing that? That is right. G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, Fordham Nice. I wanted to find the oldest object in New York. Uh, and we can argue, you know, just about how old, but this is 1.2 billion years old. It is about the oldest rock formation in New York. It is called Sea Rock, for obvious reasons, across from Bakerfield in Columbia at Spite and Dival, and it is supposed to be the oldest rock formation. It seemed like a good place to start at the beginning. Uh, this, you know, goes back to the very beginning of New York, uh, and the mastodon tusk, which is in the next slide, uh, also very old, probably somewhere 
beyond 10,000 years old, roughly at the time, roughly contemporaneous with the first Native Americans, the first Indians arriving in what became New York, the first civilization arriving. And it just seemed like a very good starting point to say this is what New York was all about at the very beginning, the very earliest part of our civilization before recorded history. Now, I love the birth certificate that you chose, the, re the report to the Dutch. I actually saw this when I was in uh, Amsterdam, New Amsterdam, uh, no, Amsterdam, <laughs> and uh, the Netherlands. This is in The Hague. Uh, I spent many hours learning how to pronounce what this is. It is called the Skahagen Brief, and it was a letter that Peter Skahagen sent to the West India Company. He was coming back on a ship uh, from New Amsterdam in uh, 1625. Uh, and he was reporting on what the contents of this ship were. And it was beaver pelts and otter skins and barrels of flour and some of the summer harvest. And he was reporting that some children were born in the New Amster Amsterdam colony that summer. And he said, by the way, we bought Manhattan Island. <laughs> And this is as close as you can come to the birth certificate of New York City. Now, of course, the Indians didn't think they had sold Manhattan Island. They didn't have quite the same concept of property rights as the Dutch, the Europeans did. But as far as the Dutch were concerned, for 60 guilders, which famously later in the 19th century was translated into roughly $24, uh, they thought they had bought what became Manhattan Island. Uh, and this, which is in The Hague, it visited uh, New York briefly for the quadricentennial of Henry Hudson's voyage in 2009, is New York City's birth certificate. And if any object deserves to be included in this book, this is surely one of those iconic ones. Now, you deal with a subject dear to both our hearts, obviously, um, to yours, and that's newspapers. And I, I've decided to describe these, and then I will let you do a riff about both of them, as Peter Zenger to the British, drop dead. <laughs> and this one, <laughs> how well, this one we remember, we practically remember the Zenger one, but <laughs> start, with, start with this extraordinary relic. Well, Harold, you're right. They both convey the same message. This one is from 1735 in the New York Weekly Journal. Uh, while Peter Zanger was in jail, he was in jail at uh, what is now Federal Hall. It was New York City Hall before that. It was converted into the first U.S. Capitol. People forget this is the building where George Washington was sworn in. It was the building where the first Congress met. It was the building where the Bill of Rights was passed. Uh, that first Congress, which met here for about 18 months, was probably the most productive Congress in American history, <laughs> certainly more than any recent Congress. And what was so fascinating about that Congress, and it is worth going back, worth for the current members of Congress, going back and reading the spirit of compromise that prevailed at that Congress. One of the compromises, which probably, or at least arguably, is one of the best things that happened to New York, was the decision to move the national capital out of town so that New York was not encumbered by a federal bureaucracy, by federal government planning, uh, and could develop not as the capital city, but as the city of capital, which it did. Uh, Bain, uh, Zanger criticized Governor Cosby, uh, the colonial loyalist governor, uh, he was thrown in jail. While he was in jail, one of the facts I discovered was his wife went on publishing the newspaper, uh, one of the many unsung women in New York history. Uh, and he went to trial, a jury trial, in uh, that building. Uh, and he was acquitted. He was acquitted uh, by a lawyer who represented him uh, from Philadelphia, Andrew Hamilton a lawyer who was meticulous in his methods, and apparently it was that lawyer who gave birth to the phrase, a Philadelphia lawyer. Uh, and he won on the basis of a novel concept, a concept 
that wasn't uh, really um, built into English law, and that was that truth is a defense, uh, that Governor Cosby was authoritarian. He was arguably corrupt, uh, and the jury acquitted him. Uh, and this was a principle that was established in 1735, long before, decades before, the Bill of Rights and Freedom of the Press was established in that very building upstairs that became the U.S. Capitol. Now, the second slide I happen to have been a couple of feet away from uh, when that headline was written. This is, this is Gracie Mansion, isn't it? Yes, this was Gracie Mansion, uh, Abe being the mayor, holding that headline in the 1970s during the city's fiscal crisis. There is a school of thought that says Gerald Ford denying federal loan guarantees to the city at that point was a good thing because it allowed the city to rally support in Congress to get its house in order uh, and therefore ultimately win those guarantees from Congress. We can debate that back and forth, but at that point, it was certainly a slap in the city's face. You could also make the argument Gerald Ford never said the two words, drop dead. <laughs> Mike O'Neill and Bill Brink, the editors of the Daily News, were out to lunch when Ford gave his speech. They came back and they said to me, what did Ford say when he was talking about New York City? And I explained it in so many words. And Bill Brink, or Mike O'Neill said, well, I guess he said, F you. <laughs> and Bill Brink put it more politely, and he said, drop dead. And eyes lit up, and everyone said, my god, that's the headline. And there it was. <laughs> and it became this great iconic headline. It cost Ford the election Absolutely. the following year, 1976. He lost New York, lost the election to Jimmy Carter. Uh, and, you know, he blames that headline for losing New York at the election. And once again, uh, shows as it showed with Peter's anger and the power of the press. And by the way, nothing more vividly attests to the fact that A. Bean was our shortest mayor than the fact that he's holding a tabloid here that's covering his entire body. <laughs> skip and go to this. Now you could have chosen a number of relics that associate George Washington with New York and you chose this Liberty Bell-like cracked uh, tablet delineating the spot where he took the oath. Where is it and well, why did you choose it? I chose it because one of the things I was looking for in the book was iconic objects. Uh, but things that were also sort of quirky that were unexpected. And not many people know, because not many people unfortunately know much about New York history. This is in Federal Hall to this day. This is the spot on which George Washington stood. As I say in the book, there are not many places where you could say that George Washington slept here in New York, but you can say George Washington stepped here. Uh, this is where he stepped when he took the oath of office on the balcony of Federal Hall in uh, the time that he was sworn in in that first inauguration. That is the slab of granite that he stood on. It is still in Federal Hall. It was painted over, you know, it was sort of vandalized in that sense. But that is the uh, slab on which he stood and it is still there. And still visible. Still visible. So skipping ahead again, I thought it was charming and and, and provocative that you chose to remind us about immigration and immigrants, not with something obvious, but with a singer sewing machine, an object that so many immigrant, young immigrant women turned to for their livelihood, but it also enabled you to speak about the garment industry, the once our biggest. Well, the garment industry, my grandfather had one of these at home. He was a pattern maker in the garment industry. And we forget that the garment industry was a driving force on two fronts in New York. One, of course, is, as Harold says, was the industrialization of New York. There was a point at which 70% of the women's garments in this country were made in New York City. About 40, 50% of men's garments, 70% of the women's garments. This is when they came from handmade fashion designer garments and switched to off the rack 
the development of department stores, A.T. Stewart, the first one, which is down in what became the old Sun Building behind City Hall, uh, the development of department stores, the development of industrialization that led to things uh, like the development of lunchtime in New York when people no longer went home for lunch, they ate lunch on the job, uh, and the factory, uh, this whole change of culture of New York, and the garment center, and the factories. Uh, and what came along with that was the development of labor unions, and of course, the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, and the development of that as a political force in New York. Uh, both a political force for labor reform, and for uh, political might and for uh, liberal labor policies. And what could be a better symbol of that, in my mind, uh, than the sewing machine? And another item in the book that, that relates to immigration, I'm not sure if it's on Harold's list or not, but we think so much of the Statue of Liberty as being a symbol of immigration. Well, it wasn't. Uh, and this surprised me. And one of the things that I loved so much about doing this book uh, you know, I start off being a, a know-it-all New Yorker, uh, but I learned so much. The Statue of Liberty was not a symbol of immigration. It was a symbol of freedom, of the French Revolution, of democracy. What made it a symbol of immigration was Emma Lazarus's poem. And that made it the beacon for immigrants all over the world. That made it the symbol of immigration that was exported from New York to the rest of America and made it the message of welcome that was exported from America all over the rest of the world. And one of the objects in the book is the original manuscript of her New Colossus. I'm going to go back to the technology here. Um, this was a techno technological marvel, as was this, and as you very cleverly point out in the book, they didn't call it the Manhattan Project for nothing. Um, tell us about what this strange looking spacecraft is in the back there. It is a cyclotron, and uh, this was up at Columbia University, uh, and this was one of the items that uh, led to the development of the uh, atomic bomb. It was called the Manhattan Project because the Manhattan Engineer District of the Army Corps of Engineers was located in Lower Manhattan. In fact, I think its first office was at 270 Broadway across the street from City Hall, where there are now luxury condominiums being sold for a lot more than the Army Corps of Engineers paid in rent uh, for those offices. Uh, and, you know, people had no concept that that's why it was called the Manhattan Project. That, frankly, was something I learned when I was doing the Rosenberg book, The Brother. Uh, but it all began here in Manhattan, not at Oak Ridge, not in uh, Washington State, uh, not in Los Alamos, but in New York City, uh, where Leslie Groves, the general in charge of the Army Corps of Engineers project, began that project, uh, and uh, the Columbia Labs were running the cyclotron, uh, which I think may now be the Smithsonian. Uh, and uh, that's where it really all began. You can find many birthplaces for it, uh, but certainly the, the nucleus, if you will, for the creation of the atomic bomb project was indeed in Manhattan. Now some things have changed for the better, and some things that are traditions that we think are traditions are dispelled in the book. A toll for the Brooklyn Bridge. How long did that reign? This was, I was amused to see that it was General McClellan's son. You know, I'm not a great fan of General McClellan because he had the temerity to run against Abraham Lincoln. But his son became mayor of New York City, and I guess he is responsible for this outrage. That's right. Uh, there was a toll on the Brooklyn Bridge. We talk a lot now about reinstituting East River Bridge tolls, uh, as that is, you know, some incredible shibboleth. But there were tolls in the beginning. I think it was uh, a couple of cents, depending on whether you had a horse or not, or were just a pedestrian. Uh, but they started off with tolls. Then, of course, you had to pay extra if you were taking a tram or trolley across the bridge. Uh, and that was to pay off the bonds of the bridge. Uh, and you know, people think of it now as 
sort of like the internet, a you know, right for total free access. Well, originally it wasn't. Uh, that started off as a tolled bridge, and it was lasted, I think, a couple of decades until the toll was removed. It was one of the things I learned from the book. So we go into a much more serious uh, area. Catastrophe is inev inevitably a part of the book. And you have some powerful relics of disasters, and I was very moved by, by all of them. Um, here's the first, and it looks innocuous. This is the fire pail from St. Paul's. Do you want to tell us about this? This was uh, the great, fire. There were two great fires in New York uh, in the uh, 18th century, and uh, they really made everything else after that. Frankly, whether it's 9-11 or whether it's Superstorm, Sandy, pale in comparison, because they wiped out arguably a third or even half of the city. Uh, one was in the 1730s, the other was right after uh, the British uh, invaded New York uh, in 1776. We still don't know who actually started the fire or if it was arson. But it's but suspicious it, enough. It was definitely suspicious and it was either the uh, Americans who were leaving the city, and it could very well have been them, it could have been the British who were invading. Uh, but this is a fire pail discovered relatively recently at St. Paul's Chapel, uh, just north of Trinity Church, part of Trinity Church, uh, and it was used, we believe, to put out the fire, and St. Paul's Chapel was actually saved. St. Paul's Chapel saved again after 9-11 interestingly enough, a charmed life, if you will. Uh, and uh, it was one of the great tragedies in New York City. Uh, it, again, it wiped out a vast amount of the city, and what people forget is how much the city suffered under the British occupation. It was more than seven years of British occupation. Uh, it was a loyalist town for the most part, uh, but there were a lot of Americans loyal to what became America who suffered greatly under that occupation. There were British prison ships anchored off Brooklyn in which many, many, many people perished under the most horrible conditions. Uh, and it was a period that uh, many people, certainly the British, uh, would like to forget. And a reminder too that we didn't have much of a chance against fire in the 18th century. This is a pail. Hand, you hand a pail to someone and they run it up the line, and, but apparently enough to save the wooden roof of the same right. A leather bucket, a relatively small one, and as Harold said, people volunteered and uh, passed one by one water from the Hudson River, uh, carried over to Broadway, mm -hmm. uh, and used to douse the fire at St. Paul. And this is the fire centuries later. This is, I was trying to think, what epitomized 9-11? How can you capture the horror of 9-11 all those years later? And this is a jar of dust collected in Lower Manhattan that very day. I don't want to know what's in it. Uh, it's too horrible to think about. But this is dust collected at that site the very day of 9-11. And it just allows us to think of the awful tragedy of that day and lets us stop and ponder the implications of what happened then and its implications for the city. It really does. It's almost a, um, a Rorschach test of, in the patterns that you see and perceive out of it. It's haunting so many ways, and a terrific choice. I mean, how do you take something so grand and fit it into a book? And I think this does it so successfully. So the next, the next tragedy to explore is, is an object that we each put in our books of X number of objects. Um, the draft wheel, a draft wheel from Lower Manhattan, but it, you know, one of those draft wheel that led to a riot that led to another fire. 
But this is your show, so you talk about well, it. Well, Harold knows more about this one than I do, but this is the wheel where names were placed in this wheel, drawn out, and if you had the misfortune of having your name drawn, you would be drafted into the Union Army in the Civil War, unless, unless you had the $300 to pay to get out of the draft. Uh, and uh, the fact that Native Americans, Protestants, were more wealthy to avoid the draft, and mostly Irish immigrants were too poor to avoid the draft, is what led to the draft riots in 1863, uh, for which troops had to be brought back from Gettysburg to suppress those riots. Uh, there were fires, looting, murders, lynchings uh, all over the city. Uh, it was a shameful episode of the city's history. Uh, and Boss Tweed, in his wisdom uh, and in his uh, political savvy, uh, passed a bond issue to raise $300 each for the people who didn't want to go into the Union Army. The city would provide that $300 to buy them out of the draft. Uh, this was patronage in the purest sense, uh, and it avoided the draft and, in effect, ended the draft riots for those people. Um, and it also created an interesting uh, side effect uh, that there were lots of enlistments of black soldiers for the Union Army that followed that. As Harold, I'm sure, knows better than I do. And, and Lincoln wisely removed the $300 substitute provision in the next draft bill, so that vanished. But this led to another fire because one of the most heinous, unreported, or largely unremembered acts of, of arson was against the so-called Colored Orphans Asylum, which is one block north of where the public library is now. Um, nearly 300 African-American children were nearly killed, trapped inside for a while, all because of the draft. And by the way, this, this, this draft wheel apparently had still had the names in it when it was found, so the riots must have started after and everybody ran for the hills. So I have one more fire story. Um, probably the greatest preserved, saved from disaster relic in New York history, the Flushing Remonstrance. Um, tell us what that means in our history. Well, the we're going back in time, obviously. Right, we're moving a little back, back and forth. This is 1657, the good citizens of Flushing, Queens. Uh, Peter Stuyvesant, uh, who was no great tolerant leader, uh, represented the West India Company, which was tolerant. And what distinguished New Amsterdam from just about every other settlement in what became America was the fact that people did not come here to mine gold. They didn't come here to convert the Indians. Uh, they came here to make money. And if you didn't interfere with that money making, you were accepted. Uh, you didn't have to be liked. So when people say that this was a great example of tolerance, perhaps that's assuming too much. Maybe it was indifference rather than tolerance. Let's not be too cynical, let's accept it for what it was. But that is what distinguished New York from virtually every other place in the country, and that is an attitude that was exported from New York to the rest of America. And it was an attitude that endured. That was part of the New York legacy. Well, Stuyvesant was not too in tune with that legacy when it came to Jews, when it came to Quakers, and the citizens of Flushing stood up to Stuyvesant and said, we don't like this. Quakers are just as good as everyone else. We are uh, issuing a remonstrance, a wonderful word, word in and of itself. And this remonstrance is saying, you have to obey by the original agreement made by the West India Company. You have to obey that agreement. And if not, you will have to be held accountable by the West India Company, uh, and we are going to make sure that you will do so. Uh, and ultimately, Stuyvesant was, uh, he was really held accountable in 1664 when the British showed up, and the people of New Amsterdam preferred to surrender to the British rather than have Peter Stuyvesant stay as the Governor General of the Colony. Uh, so 
This, and what you have to remember is this is 1657, more than a century before the Bill of Rights. And we think of all of this American history occurring, you know, in the late um, 18th century with the Continental Congress, with uh, the Congress, with the Bill of Rights, and yet here in New York, not a city known for its history. Um, it happened here. Uh, it's interesting, Ken Jackson, the Columbia professor, the editor of the Encyclopedia of New York City, likes to say facetiously, history is for losers. He means, you think of places like Jamestown, Plymouth, they sort of wallow in their history because they don't really have much else. <laughs> you know, New York, New Yorkers think of our present. We like to capitalize on the future. We don't think much of history. I think of the, the Alan Bennett play, The History Boys. One of the kids in the class is asked to define history, to which he replies more or less indifferently, well, it's just one damn thing after another. <laughs> well, that's sort of, you know, what we feel like. But so much of American history happened here. Ken Jackson likes to say, and it's something we rarely think of, America begins in New York. Well, here is just another example of that. And one of the things I like to do in this book, and I discovered and rediscovered in writing this book, is how much history happened here. And the Flushing Remonstrance in 1657 is yet another one of those things. Just very quickly before we move on to something, to some lighter fare. Um, what happened to it? Why, why does it reveal this chart crumbling outer edges? Well, unfortunately, there was a fire in the state capitol, uh, and so much of New York's history burned uh, in that fire. Blaming so, Albany. I, that's, well, I mean, <laughs> we can always blame Albany. That's sort of a foregone conclusion. Uh, always good as a default position. Um, <laughs> this, luckily, was one of the things that was saved. Right, and the Emancipation Proclamation was saved. That's, That's right. The 1911 fire. So we're going to move on to something that we both love and we both battle against, and that's food. Cool. So this must not have been a hard choice. Well, I'll tell you, what I, made, when I sought suggestions from people, Everybody suggested food. When I was thinking of criteria for objects in the book, they couldn't all be about food. This was not a cook <laughs> So many people suggested every variety of pizza, blintzes, seltzer bottles, egg creams, empanadas, uh, hot dogs, sabret umbrellas, uh, absolutely everything else. You know, that I said that given the fact that crime is declining in the city, maybe the city's official motto should be, leave the gun, take the cannoli. <laughs> <laughs> I, I left out pizza because I didn't think it was really that uniquely New York. But I thought the bagel was. It wasn't invented in New York. It comes from Eastern Europe. Some people said even Italy. But Eastern Europe, I think, is a fair place to uh, point to its origin. But I think it is so identified with New York, even though it is national, even though it is frozen, even though you can now get it anywhere, it is a New York institution. Now, there are other items of food in this book. I have some more. I, and and uh, Harold does have some more. I have to admit that the black and white cookie was a case of author prerogative. <laughs> I like them. I got the book one on my expense account. Just now, one. Just one. Now, Molly O'Neill of the New York Times says, and I dispute her on this, and Glazer's disproves her on this, she says, there is no such thing as a delicious black and white cookie. They are either edible or inedible. <laughs> I don't think so. Blazers makes delicious ones. Uh, there was a whole Seinfeld episode on black and white cookies. And even President Obama called them unity cookies. 
I'm, I'm not sure if that's endowing them with, with too much substance. I might as well go and show this now. But, but, but I think they're great. And of course, it does say a lot about you. I'm not sure what, whether you eat the vanilla or the chocolate first. My grandson eats all of the icing first. OK, let's go back to my food chain here. I, this was an ingenious choice, I thought, because it's not only about industry again, but about food. It's certainly the fuel for all the food you and I love, and an iconic sign as well. Well, it was meant to talk about industrialization and the disappearance of industrialization. There is this, there's the Pepsi-Cola sign on the East River, there's the Silver Cup Bakery sign, and I thought of this as sort of a remnant of lost industrialization in New York. Now, what's so fascinating, and people don't realize, is a lot of things are still made in New York. This is still a city of industry. There are still more than 100,000 people who are engaged in what are called industrial jobs in New York. That's a lot for any city in the country, except for the city as big as New York. But New York used to be the biggest sugar town in the world. Something like 80% of the sugar manufactured in the United States was made in New York. Exactly why it was sort of a serendipitous uh, circumstance. It was shipped here, uh, it was manufactured here because it had a relatively short shelf life and it was distributed here from the Northeast to the Northeast and Midwest uh, because we had the best uh, means of transportation by boat, by the Erie Canal, by train, uh, but New York was the biggest sugar manufacturing center uh, in the United States, certainly, and in the world. It turned out, luckily for Harold and for myself, Sweet and Low also became the biggest <laughs> manufacturer of, you know, low-carb, low-calorie uh, sweetener as well. But to me, as a as a picture of uh, of lost manufacturing, this seemed like a good option. Now, Harold asked initially, what are the objects I left out? One of the things I thought of afterward, which was also sort of a symbol of change in New York, was the inflatable rat. <laughs> <laughs> sort of as a symbol of the air going out of organized life. Uh, and that, too, would be one of my proverbial 102 objects if there is another volume to this book. And of course, this means so much in New York museum history because the Havelmeyer family, which only Domino's, became among the biggest contributors of art to the Metropolitan Museum and to other museums in the city. I'm going to have to skip over some food things here so we can make sure we don't run out of time. But I can't run, I cannot omit this one because I learned from Sam Harper's book that long before Mike Bloomberg um, tried to dissuade us from um, big sodas, there was a campaign against the artichoke. Right. <laughs> well, I was looking again for quirky objects. Uh, why in a book about New York City, a history of New York and 101 objects, would I include, say, the mechanical cotton picker? Where are you going to find the mechanical cotton picker in New York? You're not. But it was the introduction of the mechanical cotton maker in the late 1940s that freed blacks from the land in the South and began one of the migrations to the North and New York and changed the demography of New York City. And as Harold said, if you think you're living in a nanny state under Rudy Giuliani or under Mike Bloomberg, think back to Mayor LaGuardia. He banned the sale of artichokes. Why? Because Cyril Terranova was the artichoke king. Cyril Terranova controlled organized crime because he controlled the market in artichokes. And LaGuardia thought if he banned the sale of artichokes, he would get rid of organized crime. Well, that worked about as well as getting rid of the Slurpee or <laughs> big slurp or whatever. LaGuardia not only banned the sale of artichokes, he banned Cyril Terranova. He had him arrested for vagrancy when he crossed the city line from Peloton to the Bronx. That didn't work either. Uh, and it was just sort of symbolic, emblematic of 
what a mayor is willing to do, the limits of mayoral power, and the ethnic um, change in demography of organized crime over one era to the, to the next. And it just seemed like an artichoke would capture people's imagination, capture people's eye, and get people, and the whole purpose of this book, get people to think about history in different ways, get kids to think about history in imaginative ways. Not through the people you ordinarily learn or the dates you have to memorize or the events that you know by rote, but thinking about history in ways that spark the imagination and get you in to explore and get interested in it in ways that you might not otherwise do. Astonishing that we're running out of time and I want to give people a chance to ask questions. So I'm just going to make sure you all know that Sam Roberts also covers sports with Bobby Thompson's bat and Jackie Robinson's glove. You don't want to think he left that out? The one object I could not find in the book, there is only one that doesn't exist. That was one of my criteria that had to exist. The one I could not find was Bobby Thompson's home run ball. But you've got the bat. I got the bat. That's the bat is at the Hall of Fame in Cooperstown. I think that's pretty good. And they didn't do as well as this year's Giants. They lost to the Yankees. Serious. Um, and Art, oh, the small, small dean you have. Well, we got a crush, but just so you know. And for those who think that he left out Art, because he's a denizen of art museums, as we know, he, he deals with the 1913 Armory Show. And thank you for this. I made 702 suggestions to Sam Roberts, but I got this. <laughs> One of the 102 objects that got left out in deference to uh, to Harold was Bella Abzug's hat. Which I really didn't want for him. Harold used to work for Bella Abzug. <laughs> so let's, I don't want to keep the Met icon, Met button on to the whole. So who has a question for Sam? Yes. Yeah, um, I think that was very good, the connection that you made with the uh, World Trade Center and the dust and the, the wheel. Uh, for the for the draft riots in 1863, but um, events are very important, and you can't. Oh, well, I should say you can't. Uh, it's difficult omitting certain events. Was it difficult making a link between an event and something like the dust or the uh, the wheel? Well, the question was: Was there difficulty making a link between an event and an object? The idea of the object was to make people think of the event. It is not the object itself that is necessarily important. It is the object that objectifies, if you will, the event or the time period or the era in history. It's very interesting when, you know, Neil McGregor at the British Museum is sort of the father of this movement to look at history through objects. We have now spawned the whole cottage industry uh, of doing that. Harold's book on the Civil War, uh, books about World War I, about the Beatles, about uh, looking at butterflies, about New York City history, about lots of things. Uh, the Smithsonian's book of a history of America, now a history of the world, uh, and the reasons for it. In a, in a virtual world, objects lend a certain authenticity to things. They learn a certain, lend a certain dimension to things. In a materialistic world, they lend a certain value to things. No one is paying a million dollars uh, for a spoldine or for a jar of dust, and yet they have a certain value. Um, the fact that we're picking a finite number, 101, allows you to put things in a digestible form. You can sort of wrap your arms around them. As someone said, they let all of us be Simon Cowell. We can, you know, we can all make lists of things. Um, and also, you know, unlike timelines and events and, and chronologies, you get a feeling that there was a reason to invent something, that, that things didn't just happen automatically. Uh, there was a reason for something to happen and to be created and to come along and to trial and error. So I think looking at objects makes a great deal of sense. 
Um, you know, it is not, it is a gimmick in a way, of course, uh, and it can be carried away, but I think you also look at, at things in your personal life. Uh, you know, what is your rosebud moment? You know, when you go back to Citizen Kane, uh, what is your rosebud? What is that sled from your childhood? What is that uh, teddy bear, that sorority pin, that that high school game-winning football? Uh, what is it that, that is the transformational moment in your life that is captured by a single object? That's what I tried to do in this book. I tried to do it for a whole city, and I tried to create a number 101. Uh, but with so much fun about this, and we created a, an email, objects of nyc at gmail.com for people to write in. This is a participatory thing. It's a parlor game. Uh, it is fun. Uh, it is, again, not my list, it's your list. Uh, to be fun and to make people think about what you would do, uh, what you would think of if you were making your history of New York. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for this talk and Harold, welcome back. You, you the first person I heard who said that it was a good thing, blessing in disguise, if you will, that the capital moved out of New York in 1790. Can you elaborate on that? Well, Harold may have a different opinion. The, I, the gentleman said I was the first person who said it's a good thing that the capital moved out of New York in 1790. I think it's a good thing because you look at Washington and it's a dull town. <laughs> I mean, would New York be what it is today if it were the national capital? I mean, it would be green, it would be beautiful, it would be totally graffiti-free, it would be, it would be dull as anything. I mean, it would be gorgeous, but it would, it would be charming in a way like Georgetown. Uh, it would be Stalinesque in its public buildings, but I don't think it would be New York. It would not have the vibrancy of New York. It would not have the energy of New York. I mean, Harold, what do you think? Uh, I think New York is special, and if it had a national capital imposed on it, it would have broad avenues. It would have great vistas. It would probably not have the grid system, which you could argue for better or for worse, uh, you know, has its pluses and minuses. Uh, it, it's just a very, very different city. And I think it would be not as great a city in many respects if it were the national capital. What do you think? No, I, listen, it could have created all sorts of uh, uh, terrible things if government had been able to stay in the city more than four months a year in the early days of the Republic. Thank goodness Washington weather made that impossible. It limited the uh, damage that government could do. So, uh, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, the bagel. When did it, shall we say, become ecumenical and migrate and go west? When I was a kid here in New York, born and up in the Bronx, for the eight days of Passover, you could not find a bagel because all the bakers were observing Passover and they would not sell a leather diaper. That is quite true. That, I would say, it, uh, it moved out of town, migrated, I would guess, many of you probably know better than I do, in the late 50s, 60s, certainly by the late 60s, you could find it in convenience stores elsewhere in the country, then to supermarkets, and then lenders probably was the first big national frozen bagel chain that uh, probably makes more bagels today than anybody else. Uh, and it is now a national staple, and it is, you know, probably no longer an ethnic food. By the way, uh, even worse than having the national capital in New York is eating a bagel outside of that. <laughs> <laughs> and eating, eating a bagel that is not boiled, <laughs> even worse. Let's go here. Uh, with that, a thought on the bagels. The water, the New York City water supply, it was like the best in the whole country. <laughs> Perhaps a glass of water on the screen. Uh, two summers ago, my wife and I were in San Diego. We treated our sons to the Comic Con convention in San Diego. And we ate at an Italian restaurant for lunch, 
and on the menu as we were looking, it said, we have the best pizza. We import our water from New York City. <laughs> and in fact, there are bagel places around the country that do import their water from New York City and make bagels with New York City water. There's a very interesting story in the book which I allude to about New York water. The great thing about New York water is the fruit and water system, which opened in the 1830s, an ingenious system by John Jervis. Uh, fabulous system. I think there was an exhibit on it here at the Museum of the City of New York. But the original water supply of the system was actually begun by Aaron Burr. And the reason for it was not because Aaron Burr cared about water, but because Aaron Burr wanted to create a bank. And he created the Manhattan Company, which began by supplying water to the city, lousy water. But there was a clause in the charter in the Manhattan Company that he wangled out of the state legislature in Albany that said any surplus profits from the Manhattan Company could be used to create anything else he wanted. So he created a bank, which became the Bank of the Manhattan Company, which became Chase Manhattan Bank. Until the 1920s, the Chase Manhattan Bank was pumping water downtown for fear of losing its banking charter, uh, believe it or not. Something that almost nobody knows. They were serving water at board meetings from the pump they had downtown because they were afraid of losing their charter. And finally, they realized that by now, you know, they had enough uh, longevity as a bank that nobody was going to take that charter away. And you could find uh, remnants of their uh, um, wooden water pipes, which are one of the objects in the book, uh, as one of the objects uh, of the 101. Get a woman's point of view here. Thank you for your terrific talk. I loved the way that you brought up the um, the Flushing Remonstrance, and that reminds us that we're truly a five-borough city. And I wonder if you could tell us a few things that you have mentioned, perhaps from the Bronx in your book. Uh, there are a couple of things from the Bronx. I'll have to think. Uh, what the Poe Cottage, of course, is in the Bronx. Uh, Yankee Stadium, of course, is in the Bronx. What else, Mike, what else do you remember that I have in the Bronx? Lloyd, <laughs> Lloyd, where are you? What else do I have from the Bronx? Uh, how many hours do you have? Okay. <laughs> Stick ball, of course, is from the Bronx. Uh, you have that. Uh, you have hip-hop from the Bronx. Hip-hop? Yeah. I have uh, Charlotte Street. The house on Charlotte Street is in the Bronx. The right. revival, the renaissance of the Bronx. Right. And uh, if you uh, Museum said that obviously we are dealing with objects that survive. There are many objects that haven't survived. So he said, you know, there are only so many Buddhas and stone axes that you could include. You know, you can't have a whole book of those. And another is that when you solicit suggestions from readers, from people who are here today, those suggestions tend to be skewed by nostalgia, by things that people remember. So this past summer, when the Smithsonian asked Americans to pick the most iconic object in its collection, its entire collection, 90,000 people weighed in. And what, did, what won number one? Something that was one year old. The panda that was born last year at the National Zoo. So, you know, you have to think of things that will be enduring. So when I was looking at the past couple of decades, I left a lot of things out because I wasn't sure what would be enduring 
20, 30, 50, 100 years from now. So I have the jar of dust from 9-11, and I have from Superstorm Sandy in 2012, the Madonna that survived the storm and the fire at Breezy Point in Queens. Because I thought that would be, no matter what, another example of New York City's resilience, as it has survived many other disasters, and I think always will. But when it comes to you know other things that we tend to think might be important in the short run, you know, you've got to stand back and take a sort of larger picture and say, will they indeed turn out to be important later on? Before we end, tell us what borough you were born in. Brooklyn. <laughs> I think we're going to have to close it because, but Sam will be available at the book table to answer questions. And I just, I, I want to object, the only thing I want to object to, of all the things you've explored today. Object is a good word. <laughs> it's a Brooklyn, a Brooklyn pronunciation. I want to object. You described this, and I think, of course, you didn't mean to limit it this way, but you described this as a parlor game. It's something that we can all be involved in. It's, it's, it's much more, as I've read it. It's, history writ large in these beautiful little sonnets. It's not just the objects, but the way Sam has written about it. And to accomplish what he accomplished, you need the skill of a, of a consummate reporter, which Sam Roberts is, uh, who also writes like a poet. And um, fortunately for readers of New York City history, uh, we've met the person who personifies both skills, and the result is this wonderful book. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Harold, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.